Ah, cyber cybersecurity, cybersecurity champions. Uh, Jill Tokuda, Michael Cardenas, welcome to the show, you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and we're going to talk about cybersecurity. And um, and the first thing, I guess, uh, let me ask you, Jill. Um, how does that relate to um, people in companies um, that are dealing doing business with uh, the federal government, the military? Absolutely. Well, if you think about even before the pandemic, so much of our lives, our work was migrating online. And so, of course, we had to protect ourselves. And, you know, with the increase in uh, business and everything that we do and work and life moving into a digital platform, uh, cybersecurity has become even more important. And for some small to medium sized businesses and nonprofit organizations, having the capacity and the people training to be prepared for potential intrusions and attacks really weren't there. And so this Cyber Ready Hawaii program, in which Michael is one of our star cyber leaders um, and has actually gone through it with his company, I was really to put in place to um, really help with the human element, making sure that all of us are ready to be able to prevent attacks and know how to respond if and should one happen. Okay, uh, let's meet Michael. Michael, you're a cyber professional. What does that mean? Did you go to school starting at the age of five? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Um, well, cyber for me, uh, I mean, I've spent 20 years working in the federal government and uh, as a contractor. Uh, most of that is in IT and technology. And uh, just as being a federal contractor and working in the military, uh, the biggest concern for us is security, right? So we have to learn how to secure our systems, how to protect our data and information, as well as, you know, our own personal assets. So um, really an ongoing practice and ongoing education for myself and uh, you know, one that, you know, we continue to focus on here. Yeah, okay, I want to drill down on that. But before, I want to make a movie recommendation to you, Michael. Uh, it's, on, it's on Netflix, and it's called mm, The Billion Dollar Code. And it's about um, uh, half a dozen German young student people in Berlin who invented Google Earth before Google Earth did. And there was a lawsuit about it, you know, on the claim that Google Earth uh, infringed their original algorithm way back, way back in the, I guess it was the, the 90s or even the late 80s. And what is so interesting about it is that the, the trap door to this German organization was personal. Uh, it was like fishing. <clears throat> this guy uh, worked for Silicon Graphics. It's a, it's a true story on Netflix, a billion dollar code. This guy from uh, Silicon Graphics, uh, took one of their essential programmers out all night and asked a million questions about the breakthroughs they'd had in developing their Earth map. And the uh, fellow was very friendly and they responded and told him everything. And then he copied it. And then he left Silicon Graphics and went to Google. Next thing you know is Google has Google Earth and it looks exactly the same. It was a lawsuit. I haven't finished the series yet, but. You ought to be. You guys ought to be interested in looking at this <laughs> because it, it it shows you that you know the trap doors are not only electronic and technical. Sometimes oh. the trap doors are just people mm. who have loose lips. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So oh. what what's the state of play these days, Jill? Is it getting worse? Um, do we? You know, there was a piece about uh, how ransomware attacks. Uh, you know, people every X number of seconds in this country, um, it's happening, but um, what, what's the state of play? You know, well, I think you nailed it on the head, Jay, with your, with your Netflix recommendation, right? I think it's, it's so much uh, easier to actually um, not just be attacked, but really to get inside people's information and systems than we'd like to think. And you can have all the high tech gear that you want in software, but the human element really is um, the vulnerability that exists. And when you consider the fact that every second, like you mentioned, right, attacks, potential phishing scams, ransomware intrusion is taking place, it really is about being prepared and understanding what kind of human behavior and corporate culture we need to put in place to make sure that our digital presence uh, and our businesses are safe online. Um, it's not just about business, as you well know, looking at our Cyber Hawaii program, it's about the vulnerabilities that exist to government, state government, county government, our federal government in particular with this program. They understand that they can come through the supply chain and that could be the weak link that ultimately can um, do great damage 
to, you know, systems that make sure all of us are safe and taken care of every day. Now, isn't that true? We worry about the supply chain these days and maybe we don't realize that, you know, the whole world and especially the supply chain is vulnerable to attacks, electronic attacks are very important. But the other thing I think we, we should talk about is, uh, you know, you're interested in facilitating the relationship between the business community and the federal government and the military. And uh, part of that is that the federal government, the military has certain regulations and requirements and examinations and qualifications that have to be met or no deal. Um, can you talk about that? Well, you know, I think one of the things that we know for sure is that the rules are constantly changing, especially when it comes to the federal government. So even clearly what will be required for compliance when it comes to making sure that you've got the basic cyber safeguarding in place, it's literally being developed as we go along. But what we do know and what Michael and others are doing such a great job of, of working with small to medium sized businesses here in Hawaii is we know the basics that you'll have to have in place to make sure that if you take a federal contract or a Department of Defense contract, that you've got essentially what you need in place from a software element, from a policies and procedures and response element to a human training element to make sure that you're okay. So as the rules are being written and the guidelines are literally getting stronger every day, we wanna make sure our Hawaii companies and businesses are prepared to meet whatever expectations are coming so that they continue to, to get that work, get those contracts. So mo most of this, Michael, is, uh, is preparing in advance. Most of this is, is identifying those rules and regulations and making sure that a company that is doing business or wants to do business with the federal government uh, is aware of them and follows them. This sounds like training to me, um, but it also sounds like um, you know troubleshooting. So which one is more important or are they equally important? I would say, Jay, that they're equally important. You know, Cyber Hawaii a, a few months ago contacted myself, um, our company, uh, to participate as, as SMEs, as Jill would say, um, basically to go through the cyber readiness program and to try to identify, you know, where we were today in terms of security posture, right? How secure were we? Um, the, the, the truth, you know, what we felt to be the truth versus what the reality was, right? So. Um, they did a really good job spending about four weeks with us, about a few hours a, a week, just kind of going through the programs, you know, going through the policies and some of the human elements of security uh, and just really stepping through that to really guide us toward, you know, where we needed to be in terms of federal compliance. Um, what we came to find out, though, is that we weren't nearly as secure as we thought we were. Um, Isn't that we always the case? When you drill that. down, you always find things that, you know, that, that are unhappy. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, you know, the program, uh, you know, really was about, you know, training us, but also really helping us to understand where we were and how to communicate that to the rest of our companies, right? Because uh, as much as we as the IT leaders can be prepared and understand where we are, the most important thing is that we train our people, our employees, our, you know, our staff of how to have, you know, standard secure practices in, in their day to day activities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't want to tell you anything you don't know, but some people in this world, Michael, Jill, are Luddites. They, they wouldn't know the bottom of a computer from the top. And they have no idea. And, you know, just the way it works, they're going to be in this class, in this training program. How do you, how do you deal with the, uh, what do you want to call it, the differentiation between people who are being trained with a relish, you know, who are eager and interested and unafraid, uh, and those who are terrified of anything that looks like a, a computer. Oh, well, no, sorry. Go ahead, Joe. No, no, go, go. Michael, please take it away. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one, one thing that we know is, uh, you know, security professionals, you know, we know that there are a certain amount of people that, that are very technical and can understand some of the, the basics of cybersecurity, especially, you know, some of the younger generation who's grown up with iPhones and iPads and just computers in general versus, you know, not. Uh, so what I really liked about the Cyber Hawaii program is that, you know, gave us access to not only the information that we needed, but also resources and training materials that, that really help us communicate really what we're trying to uh, train people on and on the culture that we're trying to build. And um, not that it's, you know, so to say, done it down, but it made it really easy to consume um, to the point where we could easily translate that into training that was both engaging and very beneficial to our end users and our employees. 
So going back to uh, my movie recommendation, Jill, one of the, you know, one of the things is that <laughs> these guys in the, in the German company, uh, they were very trusting and friendly. And they, they had no concept of how you, how you avoid mm, telling people, uh, even people who seem to be friendly, uh, too much. Mm -hmm. uh, and that goes to the whole question of, you know, the military um, and classified information. And I guess the same thing is, you know, proprietary information of one kind or another, um, which is a, a hole in the boat, if you will. So can you talk about what you tell them, how you try to train them so that, um, you know, they don't, they don't have that hole in the boat? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I think, you know, it's, it's really just passing on some really um, basic recommendations and guidelines like Michael mentioned, right? Making sure that you've got systems in place for your employees that aren't the IT professionals, by the way. They're not the ones who do the coding and, you know, and, and do the updates or whatnot or are building the software and things, but really uh, simple things like password protection, understanding what a phishing email even looks like. And they're very sophisticated these days, Jay. It's, uh, they don't have to take you into the bar and, you know, get them talking anymore. They literally are able to mimic um, and pretend to be someone that is trusting. And it is about looking for those warning signs. So just, I think, generally creating a culture of being aware um, and stopping before you click, right? And if you do click, by the way, it's okay, but know how to respond in those particular instances. And so giving them, um, as Michael mentioned, Sample policies that they have to put in place, actual trainings that they run people through as well. That's critical. Even some of the biggest companies have these great policies in place. You never actually make sure that it is um, taught and trained to your employees. You don't double check it, know where it is. And I always tell people that it's printed out in case your system, your tech system goes down. You want a hard copy to know what you need to do next. All these basic little things um, are really critical to make sure that all the potential leaks are plugged. But again, it is a creating a culture of comfort so that everyone who knows IT and cyber or doesn't can feel comfortable in knowing that they know how to respond and, and best protect themselves. Suppose I'm uh, you know, qualified, I understand the policies, but I make a mistake, unintentional. And we have a problem you know, in my company. There's been a leak or a ransom, what have you. Um, and the federal government is always concerned about that. The closer I am to military classified information, the more concerned it would be. Um, could I lose my contract if I don't follow those policies? Could I lose my, my contract if I don't take this seriously? Um, does that happen? Michael, did you want to go first and then I can jump in? Sure. <laughs> Your thoughts on that? Is somebody in it? Absolutely. So, you know, as a federal contractor, you know, our, our daily day activity is with the military and with the federal government. Um, and part of that, you know, is about securing our information, securing the way we communicate with them. Um, and you're absolutely right. If we have, you know, incidents, you know, and in incidents where data is exposed or, you know, we're hacked or ransomware attack, um, it's critical that we know how to respond and to contain the incident. Now, what we find a lot of times, you know, IT professionals or security professionals such as myself will, will draft these policies and procedures and we'll say, okay, we have these policies and procedures, but uh, sometimes the extra step is not taken to then train the employees of the company, right? And so you technically have this policy and procedure in place, but when the actual attack happens, you really don't know how to respond or the, uh, the user sitting in front of their email who's getting phishing attacks uh, does not know how to respond. Um, and so that's the most dangerous part of that, you know, is to, to one, have policies and procedures, but also how, you know, ensure that your, your employees know how to utilize them. Um, and you're absolutely right. If you don't contain that well, you don't follow an incident response plan, you, you are at danger of losing that contract or, you know, exposing critical data. Yeah. Uh, you know, a few months ago, um, uh, Lori Ito, you know, uh, the uh, cyber uh, lady at the uh, UH. Oh, Jody you know, Ito. Yeah. Um, yeah, she's really terrific. She was on the show and she and she talked about uh, a conference they did over intrusion okay? where foreign countries and China was one of them, but not the only one. Uh, want to know what we're doing in the academic world and the research, the scientific world. I suppose it goes beyond that, too. 
it goes into your world of, of cyber and you know military contracting and the like. Um, and they had a conference, and she was part of the conference. And um, what I think was very interesting was that you know they had to protect against people who were very sophisticated and who did not necessarily intend to bring your system down yeah. or to do ransomware, but to get the goods, to get the data, to learn more about you for you know geopolitical purposes. Is that is that in your wheelhouse, Jill? Are you also concerned about that? the concept of intrusion, um, let's call it espionage. Uh, let's call it trying to get information that you know they shouldn't have, which would give them a geopolitical advantage. You know, I think considering our proximity, right, our, just our geographic location, that's always a concern that we have. It's, it's both an asset for Hawaii in terms of our businesses and even our academic institution, but it's also a vulnerability as Jody shared as well. One that, again, for, for those that are, um, in industries who have access to this information, who's dealing with it every day, it's an extra added level of security and considerations that we have to take into place. And you know, to your point that you know, you the question you just brought up that Michael was talking about, and just making sure that you know, if if your ducks aren't all in line in terms of cybersecurity, and you have a federal contract, can you be held liable? You know, just in the last week or so, the Department of Justice has been launching these um, civil cyber fraud initiatives which essentially says that if you just say you have all these cybersecurity protections in place and you've got federal contracts and then you're attacked, you could be held liable for basically lying and not truly really being prepared. So it's, it's, it's definitely being defined out more, but it is, again, um, putting an extra level of accountability in there from the federal government because uh, they understand the huge risk that exists both in state and out state, out state, out of state as well. Um, in terms of their their security and where it can happen at any point. Yeah, we still are a nation of laws. We still are. <laughs> so, Michael, um, imagine me in your class, okay? And I'm a newbie in your class, and it's the first day of training. And I ask you this question. What's the one, you know, cyber attack, intrusion, phishing, kind of um, experience that I should be most concerned about? What's the one thing that I should have top of mind at all points when I am using um, a computer or computer network or system in the context of a federal contractor uh, or a military contract? Well, Jay, there's a, there's a lot of answers to that. Um, there's so much to consider when it comes to cybersecurity and just doing things in a, a secure manner. But I would say, you know, there's four things that you want to focus on is one, having really good, strong passwords two being aware of and, you know, aware of phishing attacks and what that may look like, how to identify, you know, potentially, you know, potential phishing attacks through email. Um, and three really is just to understand how to respond when something does happen, right? You know, okay, you might want to, you might get a phishing attack, you might have a ransomware attack. Uh, maybe you just want to disconnect from the internet and, and just close your laptop and then call someone who may be able to assist you. Um, so those are some, some really quick high-level things that I would say. Um, those are probably three of the major um, items. Mm -hmm. Okay, two questions come to me on, on that. Number one is passwords are such a pain. They really are. It's, yeah. it's, the, it's, it's really a, it's the hassle almost every mm -hmm. minute of every day. And so there are programs, you know, people would like to capitalize on this and they build programs and I can name some for you. Um, and uh, those programs will remember your passwords. In fact, browsers are now built, right, to remember your, pro your passwords. And so uh, when, you know, ideally, at least for the user, right, um, you go on your machine and it says, oh, put your password in. Oh, somebody's putting it in for me. My browser or my, you know, my, my password program is putting it in for me. I say to myself, that's, re that's really terrific. It's a labor-saving device, you know, takes away the hassle. But query, is it safe? That's a mixed bag, Jay. I mean, uh, there's always that saying that, you know, you can make things either more secure or make them more convenient. Uh, and so things like where you can scan your face or your, your thumbprint or, or whatever it might be just to uh, enter your passwords for you, um, that can still be, you know, Act, if you will, it could be you know used as a vulnerability. 
Um, so there are tools out there uh, which get a little technical that allow you to do, you know, multi-factor authentication, which is, you know, a big topic these days. Um, using biometrics and thing, things like that. So, sure. but, um, yeah, if it yeah. seems too easy, maybe it, it's not so secure, right? Well, I mean, you know, anything it's um, that it's magic like that, you really wonder if they can hack into that and get everything. Uh, and then there's a terrible, terrible price to pay. Um, this is all about mm, security. And I, and I suppose, um, you know, for, you know, it's not only, and, and we talked about this briefly before the show, Jill, it's not only for people who are actually, you know, in contract with the federal establishment. It's for people who may want to be in mm -hmm. contact because yep. they have to be you know, sophisticated. They have to um, know, the, know the ropes, have the policies, systems, what have you. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of opens the lens. It opens the keyhole to a number of companies in the state that are not right now doing military work or federal work. So you could be busy all day long. Um, how do you handle companies that, that might you know, do that work but aren't doing that work? And how, how much resource do you have to reach all to the S <laughs> every SME in the whole state? Well, they have tons, you know, we, we can't duplicate Michael, unfortunately, or we would clone a bunch of him and we'd have tons of cyber leaders out there working with SMEs. Um, you know, but I will say this, you're absolutely right. While there are many companies that are not currently doing work with the federal government or the Department of Defense, given how much federal dollars come into the state, there's a really good chance that if you're in the healthcare industry, the education, you know, industry, construction, you know, IT, anything, you name it, uh, even ship repair, right? You will be coming into the, um, contact with federal dollars. And how do we make sure that if a, co you know, if you should be called upon to comply in order to continue that contract, that you will be ready. And that's really what this program is. And it's very unique. I think, as we've mentioned to you before, um, it is an online program and system, but pairing it with cyber leaders like Michael ensures accountability. It's an integrity of the training itself. And it really also provides these companies with mentors, if you will, access to, you know, professionals through Cyber Hawaii that can answer questions that they may have that goes above and beyond the curriculum. And really, really critical. We've talked to some people who were just thinking about having a federal contract, but now thanks to Michael and other cyber leaders like him, they've got a great foundation to work on to keep their everyday business and work secure. And I think that's really important for us is how do we help everyone be more digitally secure and safe personally as individuals, but especially as businesses and organizations helping the state to move forward. So um, we need more Michaels. That's a hard one to find right there, but definitely more small to medium-sized businesses and nonprofit organizations. Anyone who comes in contact um, with private information, you know, secure data, um, it may not just be classified information, you know, but how are you making sure that that is safe and it doesn't get hacked? That's, that's the big thing. You know, you, uh, you were mentioning that you had an event recently uh, where you uh, brought in some of your constituents, clientele, what have you. Can you talk about it? We've had a couple of different webinars, you know, but one thing that we are doing right now is really kind of holding some of these uh, open houses, if you will, not, you know, in person, obviously, but virtual to really be able to give people a chance to learn more about our Cyber Ready Hawaii program. I'm here from cyber leaders like Michael. Michael's a really unique case. Again, like he mentioned, he went through the program as part of his um, company. So he was his company cyber leader and then really um, graciously stepped forward to pay for it and really help other companies go through the ropes as well. And so we're, we're trying to do more of these in terms of getting small to medium-sized businesses and entities interested knowing what the program offers. And part of it is hearing from people like Michael, understanding that even if you think you got it all down, it really does help to go through the program again, just to make sure, just to double check that the training you think you've got in place is good and it will prepare you for what how you need often, to How do often program. should I go? Because you know, <laughs> there's nothing so constant as change itself. And uh, we know that you know the, the world of software and what do you want to call it? Uh, all the all the networking things around software is changing all the time. So do I need to go every month, every six months, every three <laughs> months? How often do I need to go to keep current? 
Maybe well, that's you know, a question for Michael. It is. And, you know, um, please, Michael, tell them, but go through our program once. You don't have to go through it twice, but folks like Michael will help you on create that system of how often you should be checking uh, on training. So, Michael? Absolutely. You know, absolutely. You need to go through and establish, you know, baseline processes and procedures for your company, the standard cyber hygiene. That's, that's important to do at least once. Um, and anyone that's familiar with doing business with the military federal government, you know that they make you do training almost every year, sometimes multiple times a year, specifically on cyber um, security. So um, at the very least, you know, staying abreast of all the new technologies and all the new policies, um, at least trying to refresh yourself every you know, quarter or every year. Um, that's kind of a good rule of thumb. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely not something you can just let slide. Mm -hmm. No, no. Uh, and you know what? One thing that strikes me, though, that there's a, a number of companies around town, private companies, not state, not state funded, having nothing to do with the federal government, uh, who make a living um, talking about cybersecurity. Some of them come on our shows and they, you know, they tout and promote their companies. That's OK. That's good. Uh, because this is a, it's a this is a ubiquitous problem. It's everywhere, for everybody. You, know? we, you can't exist in our society without, you know, being at risk to some extent. So, query what you know. How how do you interface with them? <laughs> I know you know you've been in the private uh, sector. You you've done this on the other side of the street, so to speak. Maybe you're doing it now on the other side of the street. What is the difference between working for Cyber Hawaii and working in the private sector? Um, you know, to sell services around cybersecurity? Uh, well, I think the biggest thing here, I mean, is especially during the pandemic, we realized that Hawaii really needed some other uh, avenues for revenue, right? Um, tourism was gone. Um, and to me, working in the tech industry, it just made sense. You know, we can work remotely here in Hawaii. We can do a lot of federal government uh, contracts here. Um, but as I heard more about some of the stricter compliance things going on within the federal government, meaning you have to be compliant in order to even have a contract, um, it really began to worry me, um, both for myself, but also for the, the small businesses around Hawaii that also work with the federal government. So um, the difference being, you know, Cyber Hawaii is free. You can participate for free. Um, you get the assistance of Cyber Hawaii to walk you through the basic processes and get you on the path toward um, you know, cybersecurity, uh, safe cybersecurity practices and compliance. So um, I don't think there's anything else like that um, that's available without spending a lot of money. Uh, so I definitely want to be a part of that going forward. So that, but that's an interesting kind of competition, isn't it? Because the other guys are not free. Well, I don't think we're in competition with one another. I think we get people <laughs> to start to think about it. We get them on a path. And then, you know, after that, you know, if they want to implement a stricter security or new technologies, I think that's where we work collaboratively. Yeah. You know, uh, Jill, uh, and Michael mentioned that uh, in the time of COVID, you know, that uh, things changed, and no kidding, uh, mm -hmm. have changed. Yes. And PS, they are changing now. And PPS, they are going to continue to change. And I wonder <laughs> how, how that changes the world in which you guys live, uh, how it changes the way you train, how it changes the way you perceive um, you know, your, your market, the SME market, uh, yeah. and, you know, how it affects, um, you know, the connection between the SMEs and the federal government. Because, you know, we are in a different place now, mm -hmm. and business is different. For that matter, the federal government is different. Uh, how has it changed for you? Absolutely. I think it definitely uh, blew wide the universe in terms of entities really needing additional cybersecurity training, help, and guidance. Not to say that it was a small universe, but definitely it reminded us how all of us in some way um, are touched, you know, by, by cybersecurity and IT, and especially when it comes to the federal government. Our worlds are much closer. We're in the middle of the Pacific, but that's really not too far these days, given the increased traffic that we have um, over the internet and how much we have expanded the use of our digital presence and self as well. So I think it definitely widened it for us. And it reminded us that even programs like the Cyber Ready Hawaii, we are literally learning as we go along. And I think that's the greatest thing. Uh, as we work with cyber leaders and companies um, through Michael and other cyber leaders as well, we're learning where are the pain points? Where are the struggles? Where can we do better as well? Working with our Cyber Hawaii members and our leaders to help businesses and companies prepare because you're right, things are constantly changing. That is the one thing we know for sure is it's constantly changing. 
how can we create an adaptive, flexible, prepared uh, digital culture, if you will, here in Hawaii that will be able to respond and anticipate whatever we've got to come next. Uh, we just know that something will come and we create some great policies um, and buy in too. You know, one of the things that I should mention is in addition to cyber leaders of the company, we often talk to the CEOs or the heads of the companies about the program in the very beginning, because as Michael well knows, you need the buy-in from the very top all the way through the company to say that this is not just something that we'll do check off the box and leave. We're going to adopt this fully. Uh, and that has to start right at the top and go through the entire um, you know, company as well. So, um, Michael, my, this is one of my pet peeves, if you don't mind. If okay. I have a software, okay, even a really good software, and I want technical support, there are some companies that pride themselves on responding to you. Very few of them on the phone, by the way. It's, okay. it's email or it's chat or something. Okay. And others, others are impossible. You can't reach them for love or money. Um, you know, you write them a, uh, an email and nothing happens, um, or they, the person at the other end is not Akamai and doesn't, doesn't really uh, care about helping you, it doesn't. And I mean, it's very frustrating. I think it's an industry problem. Um, but I wonder how you deal with that if you have a software-specific security problem um, and you need to contact someone and they are uh, living on Mars. Uh, you know, how do you deal with that? Are you better off than I am? Can you find a way to talk to these people? Because I sure can't. <laughs> they know if we could solve that problem, I think we'd all be in a better place. <laughs> um, as a you know, security professional, the best thing I can say is, you know, like the federal government, everything that you choose to adopt, do your research, make sure that you can reach them, make sure there's warranties and support processes in place. Um, and let that be part of the, your guiding you know, decision points in, to, in terms of what you choose to use. Um, there's a lot of great things out there. A lot of them are free, but like you're saying, if you have a problem with it or if it gets exposed or there's a vulnerability with it, it's, it's very difficult to get that support, right? So, yeah, okay. Well, that's, more. That's, that's, it's comforting to hear you say, you say that. Uh, <laughs> well, the other thing I wanna ask you is, uh, okay, so it's a matter of response, okay, response. So I'm and now I'm suspicious. I'm, I'm suspicious. I, some weird thing happened. Uh, it sounds like phishing to me, or my computer is acting up, and uh, or I get a ransom message. That's that always helps make your day. Um, so I say, uh oh, uh oh. I said everything that Jill and Michael were telling me is coming true on my watch now. Uh oh. Um, who do I call? Do I call you? Um, what will you do for me when I call you in a in a cold sweat? Eh? Um, I, <laughs> um, you know, I, me as a professional like security professional, you know, I could definitely put you in touch with, uh, you know, cyber incidents, you know, they typically get reported to the, you know, the federal agencies and things like that. And they can help you go, guide you through uh, how to respond after the fact, but, you know, responding after the fact is always the worst thing, right? So you want to be more proactive. You want to take some steps now. Um, and that's why we're here. We want to raise awareness for cybersecurity and try to spread that and so that people can be a little more proactive and avoid those ransomware situations, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Don't, don't be putting Michael's cell number and email on the bottom of the screen now, Jay, uh, and he'll have oh. all the calls going to him. But Yeah, you know, that was my next question, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> What's your contact? But, you know, it's a great question. And I think one of the things that leaders like Michael and others have companies immediately start to think about is, who exactly. Who do people call and reach out if they're suspicious that this might be a, a phishing email or maybe they press click and uh, we did something wrong. And so it is about in every company, in every entity, do you know who that first phone call is going to be to ask the question, to verify if it's good or not, or to figure out, do we now have to take the next step? Because I accidentally, you know, press send there. So stop, <laughs> think, don't click. We always tell people, right? Really, um, it's sometimes it's human nature. We're doing two things at one time and we press send, we enter, we just put the information in. Um, but really, in every company, do you know who that first phone call is going to be? And it doesn't mean you have to have an IT professional in your company, but that's why the person who is trained through our Cyber Ready Hawaii program hopefully will be that person that any employee in the company can call to say, 
I'm a little suspicious or oops, I think I did something wrong. And again, creating a culture of not being shame or afraid to ask the question and to get help. Um, and that's really the whole basis of making sure everyone is cyber secure. Absolutely, a very worthy, increasingly so in our complex times. Thank you so much, Jill and Michael. Appreciate you coming on. Thank you, Jay. Thanks, Jay. Aloha. Thank you.